Good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us again for another episode of Science Save Sharks. My name is Dickie Chibble, and the topic of the day is Fear at the Top, the Orca Impact of White Sharks in Ghansby. And joining us today is our senior biologist, Alison Towner. Hey, Ali. Hi, Dickie. Thanks for having me again. No worries. Thank you very much. Always an interesting chat. Um, so, Ali, guys, for those of you that are new to the show, Ali is um, our senior biologist and she's also a PhD candidate at Rose University. Um, so before we get started, Ali, can you just give us a rundown on how you got started with the DIC team and Marine Dynamics? Yeah, sure, Dickie. Uh, so thanks for the introduction. Uh, we have been live on a few sessions together now, but for those of you that haven't joined in previously, uh, I began working with Marine Dynamics back in 2007 as a, a newly graduated uh, marine biologist with an honours degree from the UK. Um, I spent the first five of years here working with them on the um, observational data, so collecting information on white sharks uh, through Marine Dynamics platform, on which I wrote the, a master's degree at University of Cape Town uh, on. And now currently just finishing up the PhD, uh, which is focused very much on the natural movement of great whites and what drives that uh, through acoustic tagging and tracking, which we actually spoke about in the previous session. Yeah, awesome. Hey, Nikita Sharkbite, always joining. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for joining. Catherine, thank you very much. Um, so Hi guys. guys. Diving right into today's topic. Ali, obviously you're looking at the, um, closely at the relationship between the ocean's two top predators, namely the white shark and the orcas. So before we get started on the actual um, topic of what we're discussing today, can you maybe just give us a rundown on both of these species? Yeah, sure. So um, I guess we can sort of reclassify them as the ocean's top predator and then the ocean's top, top predator. That's been kind of the, the words yeah. of the hour at the moment. So let's start with great white sharks. Um, not new to this this uh, area of uh, of where we are. Um, these are your largest carnivorous fish, so largest predatory sharks uh, in our oceans. They specialize very much in hunting uh, predominantly fish as juveniles, and then as they age, they move very much towards marine mammal in their diet. Um, and in size wise, they get to sort of 6.4 meters would be the maximum accepted size on the scientific record. Possibility is they could get uh, bigger than that. Um, so yeah, that's like 21 feet, it's pretty big. Um, and then weighing in maximum around two tons. So yeah, four and a half thousand pounds for those that are from America and watching. Uh, so very large bodied fish, but they are still technically fish. So in order to breathe, they swim through the ocean, water passes over their gills and they extract oxygen that way. Uh, the other predator, the top, top predator that we're gonna talk about now is the largest delphinid actually. So it's a marine mammal. So the killer whale, it's also known as the orca. So or Orchinus orca. Uh, and these guys get significantly bigger than great whites in terms of body mass. So maximum length obtainable in uh, in orcas is over uh, nine meters. So yeah, like flipping, how big is that now in feet? 30 feet or so. Uh, and then they can get up to around about nine and a half tons body weight. So almost 20,000 pounds. So they get much bigger in body mass size than, than, uh, than great whites. Now these guys operate in pods, so they work together and of course, they are marine mammals, so they actively breathe air. They come up to the surface and they, you know, their physiology is, is mammal. Um, and they have extremely specialized hunting strategies for the prey that they pursue. So they'll often work together in groups. They'll teach that uh, knowledge and transfer those skills to the young. Uh, and so ultimately quite different predators, but occupying, I guess, very similar niches to great whites. Awesome. Thank you very much for the rundown on that. Now, Ali, before I jump into my um, first question, guys, just something that I forgot to mention for those of you that are commenting. Um, and thank you for Tasha and Blair for joining in. I saw you guys drop the comment there. Always nice to have you guys watching. Um, Guys, if you guys want to comment on today's show, if you just want to view, you can watch it from any of the platform it's streaming on. But if you want to comment on today's show, you'll have to do it exclusively from the Marine Dynamics um, Facebook or YouTube. So specifically Marine Dynamics Facebook page or YouTube page. So then we can live stream your comments as well. So moving on from that, Ali, thank you very much for the description. Hey, Bob. Same oh, thing. hi, Bob. Yep. And hi, Blair as well. Hi, Bob. Yeah, thank you so much for that comment. It's always nice to see your support on online. Yeah. Um, so, Ali, um, first question. Of, 
so obviously you've been looking, um, monitoring great white sharks here for years, and we're going to be discussing some changes. Obviously, the orcas came in. So looking at your data set, um, what changed and also when did these changes start occurring? Yeah, so I mean, one thing we've discussed quite a lot on these sessions is just sort of the um, the platform that we have with the, the daily monitoring of white sharks in this area through uh, marine dynamics. And that extends back to 2007. And actually previous to that, there was another biologist here collecting data for a long time. Um, and so what that allows us to do is monitor numbers of white sharks from the surface, basically all the way throughout the year in every season weather depending and it really allows us to get a good monitor of, of you know how many sharks are in the area from from a surface level uh, and then combined with that we have the ecotourism vessel that goes out also on a daily basis monitoring for other species within the region around the Dire Island system and on the inshore um, so fundamentally we started very much focused on white sharks in the first sort of decade of me being in it here and if we'd have seen any killer whales at that time it would have it would have stood out but it just wasn't something that was very common uh, so 2015 really is the first year that I remember hearing of a sighting of a killer whale or an orca I think we should just refer to them as orcas for the rest of this it's easier so the first oh, time yeah. we, I, I'd, I'd have heard of an orca was in 2015 um, and then you I think were on the whale watching boat behind Dyer Island in 2016 and there was a pod of them that sort of shot through at the back of Dyer Island in pursuit of a, a super pod of common dolphin, which was was quite memorable. Um, yeah. Do you want to? Just yeah, that? that was insane. Now, like, yeah, here's the footage, guys. Um, so as you guys can see, these common dolphins are moving so quickly, and we just didn't know why they're moving like this because it's not natural. And then, as you guys can see, just these black dorsal fins coming out behind them like, <laughs> like that. And we actually had to put music over this video because it's basically just us screaming for about 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> Such an incredible encounter. But, Ali, um, yeah, so these guys were definitely actively chasing these common dolphins. Yeah, I mean, perfectly natural behavior for the superpod. They were just trying to get the hell out of the way of the killer yeah. whales, which were, yeah. which were absolutely pursuing them. So that was the first time that I really remember hearing of killer whales very close. Prior to that, there were two, two individuals that were seen in Walker Bay. Um, but again, not very much within the region where we focused uh, monitoring the Great Whites. So 2017 really was the, uh, the change point in our data set, let's put it that way. And here you can see just a schematic of the bay. Um, and if you look on the inshore there, you'll notice uh, we've got highlighted on the graph Jabir's Dam Reefs. And this is exactly where we tend to look for great whites, more so in the summer months. But over the last few years, more commonly, we're finding them in this, in this region. Um, and so really productive reefs that white sharks tend to stop off in. And the cage diving boats, coincidentally, would then go and anchor in this area to, uh, to show people great whites or to, to observe them and dive with them. So in 2017, what really stands out is February. I got a phone call. I was actually on shore from one of the cage diving boats that was out there. And they sort of said, you know, we've got two killer whales here around the cage diving boats on the inshore of the bay. And just as Dickie's response was with about being excited and, you know, elated that there was killer whales in the area, he'd never seen them. Uh, the staff of Marine Dynamics all jumped onto watch whichever boat of the fleet we could get. I think it was Dreamcatcher. And uh, out we launched from the claim by harbour and we were able to actually catch up with these two killer whales. Um, what immediately struck me about them was how distinctive they were. So I don't think they actually need much of an introduction anymore. They've got their own kind of celeb status. But this is Port and Starboard, uh, two males with very distinctive uh, flaccid fins. And their dorsals are completely collapsed over in opposite directions, hence their nicknames. And so these two terrorists were hanging around on the inshore in amongst the cage diving boats. Um, we were able to track them just out of the bay. And that was really interesting. And I believe that that afternoon, well, I know through confirmed photography from Tom Slough, your friend, uh, that they came then back into the, the inshore area in the afternoon. So they were kind of lulling around in the area, which was, was really unheard of for us all. Um, and so the very next day, what happened was a carcass washed out of a great white shark. And this was a juvenile animal. She was a 2.6 meter female, um, but she was intact. She was a little bit scratched up, but there was nothing specifically recognizable about her injuries that could really allow us to conclude it, it may have been killer well. And we wrote a blog about this. We, you know, we alluded to all the possibilities um, but we we knew it was speculation and we just found it very interesting. It was literally the day after these two were in the area. Now, then what proceeded to happen was in May, uh, things started to change quite dramatically. So remember, May is the time of year that Cape Fursial pups have sort of um, 
they're sort of leaving the islands uh, to go out and hunt for the first time. And they've got this nice thick layer of blubber around them and they're inexperienced. And so very experienced white sharks would tend to return to Hans Bay in May to hunt the Cape fur seals in higher numbers. And in May 2017, we got five in, well, four individual carcasses consecutively over uh, a couple of weeks washed out in this similar condition, which was just unheard of at the time. Um, and Dickie, I mean, you can remember it well. It was it was quite I mean, it's been quite well publicized as well. Everything here is yeah. on Marine, Marine Dynamics blog. Yeah, but guys, um, as Ali said, yeah, and Ali, as you say, um, guys, this was something incredibly new for us. Uh, in 10 years, I've only seen um, two white sharks wash up few uh, very far uh, apart from each other. Um, remember that one washing up at the island and then the one at Danger Point, but we've never seen anything remotely like this in these numbers. And as you guys can see from these images, um, <laughs> they they all have something very big missing <laughs> missing from them, um, which is their liver. So, Ali, um, how did we then conclude that these were that these were orca fatalities when it comes to the white sharks? Yeah, so Dickie, I mean, um, I think one thing that we need to take note of here is the size of those great whites as well. It had to have been a big animal if it was an animal that did this. So you're looking at the first individual that washed out in May was almost a five meter white shark. She was 4.9 meters. Um, and she was probably one of the most, um, well, large bodied white sharks that have been dissected in this area for sure. As you said, Dickie, previously, uh, great white carcasses haven't washed out very often at all in this area, 2012 being um, sort of the major one that I remember and then one in 2015, but nothing like this. So very large sharks, uh, 3.6, 4.2, 4.5 meters, and each one of them was sort of torn open. As you can see, those tear marks, those um, gaping holes on the underside of the shark. Um, and then notably the livers were extracted, but also combined with that on these individuals, there were very clear scratches that didn't look familiar uh, to be sort of anything else uh, in the high water mark when we look, measured the interdental spacing of them and we presented these photographs and circumstances to orca experts around the world it just came in thick and fast that these were rake marks which are the tooth impressions of killer whales so typically this is actually a black and white image here from one of Ingrid Fisser's older papers so she's a renowned expert in New Zealand on orcas uh, and that's actually marine mammals but you can see that the spacing between the teeth is much larger and and quite identifiable um, and so that was present on most of these animals um, but then of course the fact the livers were missing and on top of that each time we did a necropsy either we had a report of the two killer whales in the bay or very close by so it's kind of all the pieces of the puzzle were together at that time. And, you know, if an expert in, in orcas and white sharks, like we had Dr. Mike, Malcolm Smale, who flew in from the Eastern Cape for the very first necropsy, uh, everybody was happy to conclude, well, not happy, but willing to conclude it could only have been the killer whales that were responsible for this, uh, these injuries. Yeah, 100%, Ali. And as you say, as if um, the evidence on the bodies of the of the white sharks were not enough every single time this seemed to happen the orcas were right there they were either there um or very close by within hours um sometimes of of this happening which was just i mean coincidence well looking at all this all this data comprised obviously we came yeah. to that conclusion I mean, look, if you go back to the image of the carcasses washed out, the one particular individual in the bottom right hand corner is very pale in complexion, which a lot of them were. I mean, you get mass bleed out when you extract a, a shark's liver. And we'll talk about why livers in a moment. But that particular individual was in June uh, off Pearly Beach. Hello, Charlene De Silva. <laughs> Sorry, hey, Charlene. Very, very good friend and fellow uh, shark sister there uh, involved in the conversation. So, um, this individual that had washed out in Pearly Beach was um, literally lying there with its liver gone and on the back line of the surf were the two killer whales. In fact, as we ran the necropsy on that specimen in the afternoon, I think you and Dickie were out at sea yeah. with the two killer whales in the area, tracking them, hanging around where the carcass had yeah. washed out. So exactly, it's, exactly. Yeah, it's kind of lots of things going on there. Um, but but I think it's important just to address that as well now, why the liver? Uh, this story has been pretty high publicized, but, you know, these organs are huge in sharks. It's almost a third of their body weight. And, you know, a white shark of 
let's say 1.1 tons, which the first female was minus her liver, likely had a liver that was around about 80, 90 kilos. And, uh, you know, in the UK, they used to light the streets of Dublin's in the Industrial Revolution, uh, of Dublin in the Industrial Revolution with basking shark liver oil. So highly lipid rich, really profitable uh, part of the shark to extract and consume if you're a killer whale. Yeah, um, definitely, Ali. And I have heard um, or I've spoken to people that work um, with orca predations around the world and they've told me for this is orcas preferred sometimes just taking specific organs from specific animals. Like I know um, with certain whale species, certain types of orcas preferred literally just eating the tongue of the whale um, and letting the rest of the body go to waste, as, as, as you can say. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're very selective on, on what they want to take. And there's also theories about, you know, them possibly returning to those carcasses later. And, and the thing is, often if, if a shark carcass is taken by orcas and its liver is ripped out, it will sink. So we're only seeing actually the specimens that wash out of the ocean. The likelihood is that there could have been more. Yeah, hundred percent, Ali. So these predations that we've spoken about now are just on great white sharks. Are there any other species? Um, what's up, Angela? Um, pick behind you looks good, <laughs> Ali. Oh, I agree. <laughs> um, so these, uh, what we're talking about now, are simply predations on great white sharks. Are there any other species that we are aware of when it comes to comes to the orca predations? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, Ange. That's my big sis, by the way. <laughs> Thanks for joining in. Um, yeah, so these great white sharks are certainly not the only species to have been confirmed predated by orca in South Africa. Um, so if we go back to 2015, actually, um, there was a whole bunch of seven gill sharks, so cow sharks that were taken in Miller's Point in False Bay. So geographically around the corner from us, actually. Uh, and also identical injuries to the specimens we observed in Hans Bay. So again, uh, rake marks on them, uh, torn open, livers missing. Uh, in fact, very good friends and colleagues of mine wrote this paper. Um, and they were actually out on a boat at Miller's Point surveying with dive equipment for carcasses and who swam under the boat at the time, port and starboard. So it's almost like, you know, in these sort of murder mysteries, the killer means it remains a bit conspicuous, but it's almost as if they pop up all the time just to go, hey, we're here. Um, yeah. So look, I mean, we're, we're talking, we're not getting too sciencey today. We're just talking about what we've experienced in our, in our personal capacity. And this was really interesting. This paper is out, it's in Ecosphere by Tamlin Engelbrecht. Um, it's called Running Scared. And she documents a whole bunch of carcasses that washed out in sync with the killer whales. And she does a nice lit review on the killer whales as well. And uh, sort of what we do and don't know in terms of our, our, our Southern African um, orca pods. Thank yeah, you, so Nicole. Nicole. <laughs> Yeah, so guys, while we're just doing Charlene A again. Yeah, we're going to get there. Definitely blue sharks offshore too, uh, particularly around the pelagic longliners for the swordfish and tuna. Uh, it's not uncommon to see orcas out there. And, and again, taking the livers or the brains of the swordfish, so being super selective on the organs. Um, but that's two species of sharks, Dickie. We've done uh, yeah. seven gill and whites, but now there's, there's others as well. Yeah, like so these. Yeah, like this one. So this is A? Bronzy. Okay, so bronze whale or a copper shark, guys. I remember this day. You can actually still see my surfboard. <laughs> in, that's yeah. that red in the picture. Yeah, precisely. I mean, look, it's you can't question how similar those injuries are to your seven gills and whites. Now, we'd kind of hoped that bronze whalers or copper sharks were able to sort of somehow evade predation. And some theories were even flying around that, you know, because specifically around the sardine run in South Africa, you do encounter bronzies and orcas sort of all feeding on the biomass of sardines. But these guys didn't evade predation. So this bronzy, we actually uh, necropsied uh, myself and Ralph with Dickie. And again, minus its liver, um, rake, rake marks on the pectoral fins. Um, so, yeah, it seems that they also didn't avoid predation. 100% Ali and I remember this day clear clearly when I got the call for the bronzy I think I actually when I got to the beach I think I actually gave you a ring and I was like oh no uh here we here we go again because you can immediately I mean you can you guys can see how similarly that looks to the carcasses of the great whites and even the seven gills that that we just shown yeah and then i think moving on from bronzies we have some more images here so 
Um, last year, I was attending a UK uh, travel show and a couple, it was actually in Manchester with South Africa Tourism. Um, a, a couple came to me and said, you know, we've got photos of Plettenberg Bay of, of orcas ripping a liver out of a shark. And, you know, you kind of think to yourself, hmm, really? What species? Maybe a white shark, but you don't really know until you get the photos and you, you get to look at them yourself. And I was blown away when I opened up my email and this very nice couple had sent me this data. So actually it was six orcas, not port and starboard, um, that extracted the liver of this basking shark. And I think equally as impressive to me was they saw a basking shark. I mean, yeah. I've never, never seen one of these in all my years of being out there and thousands of hours at sea, never seen a basking shark. And I'm British, so that really sucks because I should have seen one by now. <laughs> uh, we have plenty of them in the UK. Um, but yeah, so these guys that it were, it were seen and photographed extracting the liver of the basking shark off Plettenberg Bay in 2010. And so that begs the question as well, these weren't port and starboard, these were other, these were another group of orcas, um, pod. So yeah, lots of interactions between sharks and orcas that we are now starting to learn about right here off the South African coast. And this wasn't really known so well, uh, especially in the coastal seas. Yeah, man. Um, and Ali, this isn't unique to South Africa as well, is it? No, absolutely not. So all around the world, I think there's 21 different species of elasmobranchs that have been implicated as prey species to different pods of orcas. Remember, in the northern hemisphere, the consensus is that the killer whales ecotype into groups and they have much more prey selectivity. So they'll tend to stick with ma major prey groups and, and, and not sort of generalize too much. But down here in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, it's, it tends to be that they're a little bit more versatile. That's what I'm picking up from the literature. I'm by no way an orca expert at all, and much more in the sharks, but from who I've spoken to in the papers, it tends to be, yeah, that the, the Southern Hemisphere, mainly from an accessibility standpoint, a lot more of the offshore orcas here as opposed to, you know, your, your inshore residents and things. Um, so yeah, 21 different species are documented inside orcas bellies or being predated on by them physically at sea. Uh, so we've got tiger sharks off the Cocos Islands. We've got South America, Argentina, uh, Argentina. We've got uh, also seven gill sharks, New Zealand, Ingrid Fisser's work, plenty of documented encounters of orcas killing seven gill sharks and extracting their livers there. Um, and similar, some areas, similar methods, some a little bit different. But this whole ripping them open at the pelvic girdle and just because that's where the liver is basically connected up here. So then the liver would slip out and sometimes the testes or the heart go with it as well if the, the, the specimen is really unfortunate. But it tends to be, um, you know, some kind of extractive method where they work together. Um, and stingrays, I mean, let's not forget they're flat sharks. So plenty of stingrays that have been predated on by killer whales, particularly in New Zealand as well. And what really, what really, that's very interesting Ali but what really also goes to show is how similar all these predations especially on the sharks look like I mean they they all look exactly exactly the same and obviously these orcas can echolocate um, and I know that they can can actually in echolocate strongly enough to to see organs with inside the body so they know exactly where to go and what what they're looking for and obviously these these specific animals are are very skilled. Um, but bringing us back to what happened, what happened here, Ali, is uh, remember when all those sharks, uh, when the great white sharks left, for us working in the industry, it was basically, um, what's up, Duncan? Um, Ali, I'm handing this over to you. Yeah, I don't think so, Duncan. I've just read it. I don't think to any significant extent that would be. The liver biomass size is far more profitable. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's like, let's say you've got a large shark and it's got a 90 kilo liver. Uh, I don't think the kidneys would be sufficient enough or yeah, of interest. Awesome. Okay. Thanks. thanks for... hey, hey, Lindy, thank you very much for watching. I haven't seen you in a while. You should come visit. Um, so bringing us back to what, what happened here, Ali, is I remember all of us that have been working in the industry for very long, we were not used to the absence of, of these white sharks, which brings me to this. Um, obviously, the absence of an apex predator has a massive impact in the ecosystem. Uh, so can you take us through what happened in the food web? What did we start seeing um, once the white sharks actually left the area? 
Yeah, I mean, super interesting, but also in the same stroke, super worrying. So here we have in the Bay of Hans by Dyer Island, which is a really important breeding area for so many different uh, seabird species, but very much so the African penguin, which we know is critically endangered. Uh, and then just adjacent to the, uh, the island itself, we have Giza Rock, which is home to, it's a, a resident pinniped colony of, colony of uh, like 60,000 Cape fur seals. So these two areas, I mean, in our science previously, we have documented that there are impacts of white sharks seasonally just around this island system. A colleague and a friend, Michelle Weissel, put out a really good paper looking at how refuge and how high risk uh, times of year, you know, scope how the seals move. So in winter season, the seals would be a lot closer to the island when sharks are, white sharks are abundant. And then throughout the summer, they're less vigilant and they're more sort of dispersed. Um, so in the absence of white sharks, I think that's what's important to highlight here is in the wake of 2017, after things really started to change. So killer whales came in, white shark carcasses washed up, then white sharks started to vanish from the area and stay away from long for long periods of absence. Uh, at Dyer Island, we started to see the seals become less vigilant. Um, sorry. Yeah. And just sort of much more abundant in the water and spending longer time periods in the water. And I think, Dickie, you also observed this going around the island frequently on the, yeah. on the ecotourism boat. And so what this means is now the African penguins, as if they don't have enough to deal with in terms of threats, they're now having to evade predation from Cape fur seals, which actually is a thing. And I think not many people are aware of that. And Dickie, you've yeah. experienced this yourself. Yeah, 100%, Ali. So, guys, while Ali was um, on the shark cage diving vessels during this time, I was actually skippering the eco tour um, around our island on during during that time. And we definitely, it, we used to have far, few and far between, not that much, um, young male cape fur seals that would predate on the penguins. So these seals are incredibly smart. So what they would do is they would actually wait for the penguins to come back with a stomach full of fish and then just take the stomach of the penguin. So the whole carcass remained. Um, so it was easy for us to to actually find, find these carcasses. And I remember during the absence of the white shark and just um, looking at all the birds that we had to take to our African penguin and seabird sanctuary, we started seeing more, um, not just African penguins, but seabirds in general, like our Cape cormorants, um, with bite marks and uh, predations of them of, of Cape fur seals. So that definitely shot up, Ali. Yes, you're right. I saw, I saw a definite, well, um, definite trend. Rise, yeah, definite rise, yeah. rise in that trend as well. Yeah, I mean, and, and sorry, hi, Steph, my other big sis is on today. I've got all the female support going on here today. <laughs> um, yeah, so as you say, Dickie, that's that's the thing. So the African penguins are now being um, selectively targeted by more rogue seals that are in the water that are learning to rip out their stomach contents. And as much as this is graphic and it sounds awful, you know, it also can't be afforded on an ecosystem that is already vulnerable to button up cascade. So we've got a whole overgrowth of kelp around the system, a lack of abalone. And now we've got the top predator missing. So now we've got this, yeah, it's like dominoes. So in terrestrial papers as well, it's extremely common to hear that when there's alterations in trophic levels of certain species, then it's other species are affected directly from that. And I think what was really mind blowing in this situation was just how quick it all happened. Um, but of yeah. course, when you try when you're trying to navigate peer review on something like this, then you have to have quite a wealth of data to support the claim because the term trophic cascade is quite, you know, quite a, a prominent term. Um, but certainly we saw some very quick alterations in the wake of having no top predators around. 100%. Hi, Karim. Hey Kareem. Yeah. Kareem actually messaged me before the talk that he was super excited. Sasha. Um <laughs> yeah, sorry, Sasha. Also, yeah. She will, she will totally know about this because, I mean, Sasha was one of the top white shark biologists in uh, Mossel Bay, and she just produced an awesome paper, by the way. You guys must go and check it out in uh, Freshwater Marine Research uh, on the whole humpback whale uh, situation with white sharks feeding on it. Uh, but, yeah, thanks, Sasha. I was also equally surprised by the basking shark. It uh, goes to show citizen science is really important, and the more eyes out there that you can communicate with as a scientist, the better information you have. And that goes for everything, fishing, drones, the lot. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I've heard. I've also heard incredible, um, like, like talking about the the orcas that specifically hunt common dolphins. Actually, Grant, you know Grant Hunt very well, Ali. Um, yep. He actually showed me some photos the other day of right in front of his his house. Another type, 
another few orcas coming through and specifically predating once again on on common dolphins so obviously there are different orcas feeding as we establish feeding on sp specifically different species um different prey mammals or fish etc um tasha things that make you go ah <laughs> smart <laughs> Ah, actually like that. So obviously it didn't just have an effect on our on our food web, but also on the ecotourism alley. Would you mind taking us through a walk through that? Because obviously we've got um, we're as a town and as a system here, we are largely reliant on our ecotourism. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, as much as the orcas were detrimental to uh, the ecotourism for a period of time, it was nothing compared to COVID, but that's another side note. Um, but yeah, so 2017, in the absence of white sharks, um, we started to see initially this complete void of, of, of interaction. So of course, Hans by being renowned as a, a white shark capital of the world, has a huge international footfall of tourists that come through and a multi-billion revenue for the ecotourism and not only that, the hospitality sector in South Africa. Uh, guest houses, you know, restaurants, other activities within the country benefit from these tourists that specifically come uh, to South Africa to see their white sharks in Hans by. So now the white shark went there and we were faced with, uh, yeah, a really challenging period where actually there was a complete absence in sharks. So what then started to happen was really interesting. We started to get another individual, <laughs> well, another individual, a whole bunch of them, another species of shark in the area called the, um, the copper shark or the bronzy, bronzuela, uh, Carcarinus brachiaris. And I know Dickie and Alina did a fantastic live session just two weeks ago on this uh, particular species of shark. And they were very uncommonly seen at the ecotourism boats for shark diving in our area. Um, we know that they're around in these parts, but they simply just would not be commonly seen at the boats. And that can well be, you know, a uh, predatory rivalry between these guys and white sharks. So then sort of not coming up to the boats because of so many white sharks being around. Um, but in the absence of great whites, they kind of took over the show and, and made it all about themselves. And they're fantastic animals to dive with. So what was really wonderful for us at that time was we got so many international and national people coming out on the boats, going diving and actually coming back and saying, you know what? Wow, we didn't see a great white, but we saw this fantastic species that we didn't even know much about. It was totally under the radar. Uh, and they're a beautiful color. They're really interactive around the boats just, just to dive with uh, in general. And so, yeah, we, we had this whole changing composition of shark species in the area. So, again, driven by the fact the white sharks were absent. Yeah, 100%, Ali. And one thing that you mentioned earlier, which I also just like um, to just emphasize again, was, guys, how quick these changes actually happened. Um, obviously, there was quite, quite a bit of an absence in the white sharks, but then the bronzes just came in like full force. Like we've never seen anything like this. All of a sudden, we're seeing so many different individuals and also the predation, how quickly the seals started started predating more and more on the birds. So the absence of the white shark had a huge effect um, in all areas of the of the ecosystem as Ali, Ali, Ali as you said, uh, like a domino effect almost. Yeah, and, and like not unique to the marine situation, in fact, much more prevalent in the terrestrial uh, systems, but there's so many classic examples of where higher abundance of predators or new predators move into an ecosystem and, and everything is affected. Your Yellowstone National Park in Utah being one of your classic textbook examples, reintroduction of wolves there. And then of course, even from orcas off the western coast of uh, the States, you know, the whole keystone. So you get more orcas in an area, they predate on the sea otters, the sea otters are, you know, then the urchins start to uh, proliferate and the whole ecosystem changes in, uh, in, it, in its balance. So it's something that I think that we really do need to keep a very close look on, not just monitoring interspecies interaction, but a broader picture of all the species in the area that you can access information on. Yeah, yeah, 100%, Ali. So um, moving on to another question that I want to ask you, obviously there's a lot of speculation um, and talk about the orcas being behind the disappearance of the white sharks within Khanspai and False Bay. And I just want to touch on this and ask you what your thoughts are on, on, this, on this topic. Yeah, and I mean, it's a really good question because, you know, ultimately what we can see 
specifically in hands by is that the killer whales coming through here have an undeniable impact. Um, but orcas aren't new to South Africa in that, as you can see, and as Charlene pointed out earlier in the presentation, you know, in the in, uh, industrial longliners offshore in the pelagic seas, orcas were quite commonly encountered. You can see there, this is uh, historical data from one of Peter, uh, the late Dr. Peter Best papers, but uh, the area we're based in hands by doesn't tend to have any uh, recorded uh, incidents, even though I'm sure there were uh, people that saw them, but just not common. And now what we're seeing is this sort of more prevalence of orcas on the inshore of South Africa. So it begs the question is, you know, what's going on out there? There's likely a lot of pressures on the food resources that killer whales would have been foraging for in the offshore. Could that have caused them to come closer to shore? And could that be why, and it's already discussed in uh, Engelbrecht's paper from last year, why we're seeing more and more encounters with them. Um, remember, there's a whole multitude of pressures out there on, on shark species in general. And so we need to be really mindful of this situation and work together and also, you know, use the, the movement data that's at hand. So it's so, you know, it's actually wonderful to see this expert panel now from government of scientists that are have access to, to such data and are working together to really try and uh, combat the cause. Because of course, everybody has the future of shark species in Southern Africa at best uh, interest. But I do think it's a complex issue and I don't think the orcas are a separate issue from overfishing. And I mean, Dickie, you know, Marine Dynamics have been campaigning for, you know, getting uh, better surveillance out there for not just long lining, but all fishing methods uh, throughout the, the years. So it's, it's complex and it's all in sync and it's not separate issues, but undeniably when they come through in these coastal bays, there is, there is an impact. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, looking at the data, obviously these, um, these orcas do have an effect, an immediate effect here on our white shark populations. But as you say, Ali, um, overfishing, lo illegal long lining, um, all that and unregulated fisheries definitely do uh, play a role as well. And I, I also agree that all of these things are 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 in, interlinked and shame man <laughs> the poor white sharks all of us are just like all of us love and care for white sharks um and they're just being targeted from from all angles so um ali thank you very well, much all sharks i mean all sharks matter and remember there's environmental characteristics to consider as well we've had a paper that got produced in false bay just last year which showed a whole bunch of species that have um, redistributed east and they had really long-term climate data as well. So looking at current patterns, looking at you know gradual decreases in water temperature, uh, there's so many complexities that feed into it. So again, it's just it's so nice that people are collaborating, and that's that should really be encouraged for for not just decent management but decent advocacy of the future of these species as well. So big big complex issue for sure. Yeah, hundred percent, Ali, and I could not explain it as well as you. <laughs> um, I just saw Roxanne was on. Roxanne, um, thank you for watching, and Kareen. Hi, Roxanne. Uh, Hi, Kareen. Did you just say white shark lives matter? Um, yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do, Kareem. Um, Anna, uh, Anna was also here. Um, thank you very much for for tuning in, Anna. Um, Hi, Anna. He's just asking actually, what's the latest on white shark sighting? So. Um, I think we're just going on to that now. Um, yeah, I do yeah Ali, I was just going to say. Um, and hi, Jack so, in Scotland. Uh, so I was just going to say, guys, um, Port and Starwood were spotted in um, in between uh, Hans Bay and False Bay about a week, two weeks ago now, and like clockwork, boom, guys, we did have a white shark washing up in Hans Bay. Um, and like clockwork, basically, we had the white shark wash up and then I heard about the sighting right then. So there we go. And as you guys can see clearly, um, it's the exact same same case there, Ali. Yeah, I mean, the injuries on that shark are identical to the previous white sharks that washed out in hands by and uh, very much the seven gills and the bronzy. Uh, so. Yeah, this individual, Ralph Watson, my colleague, and Kelly Baker uh, led this necropsy and immediately confirmed no liver, ripped open at the pelvic girdle, 3.6 meter male, uh, so not a small great white. And, you know, we were kind of hoping they could, they were, they were going to start recovering here. So, you know, it's just one of those situations where, you you know, you go and do these things and you, you know, you learn every time, but you can't help but be worried by this. Um, and as Dickie said, two, three days later in Simonstown, Port and Starboard were confirmed lurking around in the shallows there. In fact, Sasha, who joined the talk now, was, I think, on the mountain with the binos, actually watching them 
um, from shore. So that that just happened. Um, and then the last tag that we did of a white shark um, in Hans Bay, uh, remember we're acoustic tracking them and we're monitoring them via either active receivers on the boat or via a network of um, acoustic receivers in, in Southern Africa, ATAP. So that's the array of ATAP. Um, we're gonna talk a bit more about that in the next session. Um, but the last shark, white shark that we tagged in hands by, she shot off east. So last detections we got her, off her were in Sodwana, uh, which is almost on the way up to Mozambique. And within five months, she swam around 18,000 kilometers. So she, she was what? going like 100 mm -hmm. Ks a week. She was, and actually very close to the time that uh, killer whales were sighted in our area. So she sort of went back on herself to Walker Bay, to hands by Harbor. We got a detection on one of our receivers off her there, and then she made her way right up the coast. So, yeah, it just goes to show there are sightings of these uh, species that we are, well, the, the individuals we're seeing in Hansby further on up east. And this is one of a few individuals that we've tracked in a similar fashion. So, yeah. yeah. Very interesting, Ali, and thank you very much for um, all the all the information and all the facts you've given me today. Um, and for everybody that was watching, Andrew, um, are you watching what, us what? at the supermarket queue? What a legend, bro. What which, a which legend. Which supermarket? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Nikita, um, always nice to have him tune in as well. And everybody, thank you very much for watching. So, guys, our Q&A will, will be on Friday. And Ali and I will be going to see tomorrow, won't we, Ali? Yeah, we're going to take the research boat out tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What, what was will... that noise? <laughs> uh, that's um, a bike oh, oh it's a it's a bike driving fast really um, really really fast <laughs> that was really weird um we're going to take out Loazi, which is the research boat so we're going to go to first of all roll over the acoustic receivers as part of the atap array um and then we're going to go and actually i think do some recce dives to find out if some of the receivers that were previously there haven't washed out because we've had a hell of a storm that just hit the cape coast uh, the last couple of weeks and then finally we're going to go and have a look for some white sharks and the honest is if we find them we have some tags that were sponsored by uh, save our seas foundation that we are really hoping to put out because i think now more than ever it's important to learn where these animals are spending their time yeah everything that we've just said definitely i couldn't agree with you more um so guys if you want to give us any donations always just visit our site um www.dict.org.za it does fund into our into our research and conservation work that we do and ali and i will be che checking for white sharks tomorrow as well as doing some of that research and then we'll update you guys remember today it's not the q a guys um thank you very much if you guys have any questions please remember to um to just drop them um, and then we will try to get to them on Friday when we are doing the Q&A and we'll tell you if we saw any white sharks tomorrow, which would then be yesterday on Friday. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that question now, were they favoring males and females? Well, in our hands by data set, they tend to favor females. So I don't know, <laughs> I don't think there's any correlation. Remember, you know, the, the females that we get here can be specifically in winter months quite large and remember larger shark, larger liver. Um, and also, I just want to say hi to Hannah Rudd because I saw she quickly popped up with a comment. I don't know whether it was how's it. And then uh, she's also somebody who's very much in our female shark fields. And she's um, she actually wrote a nice blog on the uh, leading women in shark science in the UK uh, last week. So hi, Hannah, and thank you. Um, awesome. Tasha hey, Tasha. Me. Happy birthday, Tasha. Uh, thank you very much birthday. for tuning in on your birthday. Um, so, guys, thank you very much for joining us. And Ali. Uh, wow, this has been a long session, guys. Uh, such yeah. a cool talk. And thank you very much for all the info, Ali, because this has been very interesting. And I've been looking so much forward to actually having this discussion with you and picking your brain on this and finding out the facts. So thank you very much for joining us today. You're welcome. It's so nice just to talk about it honestly without cameras or media skewing the story or just talk about what we saw and what our experiences was so and you were very much a part of that Dickie so thank you for hosting all of these sessions and yeah I'm looking forward to Friday yeah me too so guys thank you very much for joining us have an awesome day further and Ali I'll see you tomorrow cool take care Cheers. thanks everyone bye